So thank you and, and welcome to PA Consulting's Milnet podcast. As we approach Armed Forces Week towards the end of this month, we're having conversations with veterans about their time serving and their experiences both before and after their service. Um, so thank you for taking the time. It's a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. Since picking up your book last week, A Rolling Stone, Taking the Road Less Traveled, um, I've been really looking forward to having this conversation. So thank you for taking the time. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, it, we, we were just talking about mindsets, and um, I, I genuinely think it takes a pretty unique mindset to do some of the things that you've done. Um, as with a lot of really successful people, I think it's their mindset around failure that really sets them apart. Um, on your first attempt at climbing Everest, you had to turn back. And, and I almost don't want to call that a failure because by any any normal measure, you at that point you had gone further than most people on this planet ever will. But you, you're not really the person, the kind of person that deals in normal measures. So I, I, I suspect that that did affect you. So I'd, I'd love to get into that. Um, perhaps to set the scene, can you talk about what happened leading up to that decision to turn around? Sure. Uh, so yeah, this was when I was 21. I went to Everest when I was 20. It was the final mountain of my, or in theory, it was going to be the final mountain of my seventh, seventh attempt, which is the highest mountain on every continent. Uh, and Everest was, the one I dreamed of, it was the first book I read that inspired this whole project. It was the posters on my wall. It was Ed Hillary, George Mallory. It was very much, some of Everest was was the sort of big goal. And I'd been aiming towards this for three years at that point, very diligently fundraising and eventually got the funds together for the trip and made it to base camp, which was the main objective really. And then you sort of have to make your way up the mountain as I said, I was young, and I think that probably shone through as the trip went on in terms of reframing failure. But we then fast forwarded, you spend two months on the mountain, and you have this process of acclimatization where you go basically half the way up and then back down again, two thirds of the way up, then back down again. The mantra being climb high, sleep low, you're trying to allow your body to adapt to the minimal oxygen in the atmosphere very tedious, slow process, and it's it's not a spectator support. Support It's it's slow, monotonous, and it's about, in my mind, what goes on in your head rather than in your legs or your lungs. And you're just trying to put one foot in front of the other. I got to high camp very late on the penultimate day, and I was, I was very tired. I struggled to eat at high camp. I had some uh, Pringles, a few Pringles with me, and a, a a pack of jelly babies which had sort of solidified in the cold and shared that around the tent with my tent mates and we were just um struggling and i remember them getting up to start in the morning or in the night at 9 p.m or 10 p.m and i just wasn't enthused about what was ahead i just uh, I'd relaxed for about two hours and we were off again i just i wasn't in the right mindset to get going but th then we set off um into the darkness and you put your head top try and put your rucksack on and just start going into your own little world really of a um, head torch in front of you and then my head torch cut out after a couple of hours and there was actually no one else around me and I read these stories now about crowds of people and it wasn't wasn't the case for me I was by myself and I could see lights ahead of me on the on the ridge but I just sort of fumbled forward without a head torch because the batteries had run out the replacement batteries I had 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 run out in the cold so i was going off the route and trying to navigate my way up and basically just headed straight up the mountain which is um pretty dangerous in hindsight but at the time i had this sort of focus on on progression i then got onto the northeast ridge and it got too precarious i knew the the route um from satellite images and from stories people had told me and i I basically assessed that I couldn't carry on. It was too risky given uh, given the drops either side. So I waited 
somebody joined me and we followed as a three Sherpa climber and then myself and the Sherpa then got uh, incredibly altitude sick at the base of the first step, which was the main obstacle, the first main obstacle on summit day. He got very altitude sick. He had summited twice before, but um, he thought he was going to die. He refused his oxygen mask. He took that off, refused the oxygen we tried to give him through photos of his family off the mountain saying he was going to die. He got very altitude sick and delirious. So it required another Sherpa to come up behind him punch him, right hook around the face, and um, take him down the mountain. We then, uh, another, it's it's almost absurd, it didn't even get more absurd. At the top of this obstacle, the guy I was with then asked me what the weather was like and whether we should turn around because he thought it was grey and clouds closing in. Uh, and I told him it was beautiful clear blue skies like it is today. And his corneas had started to freeze and he descended. I carried on going, came across another teammate of mine who was um, at the base of the second step. And he was, in, well, the second step is a 90 foot rock obstacle on the route. And it's the biggest one, biggest obstacle, very difficult. He was blocking the route. Again, to, sh to cut that story short, he was so attitude sick, he couldn't remember his name, couldn't put it on his rucksack. And again, so delirious that he had to get uh, taken down by Sherpas. Um, we had to give him uh, dexamethasone, which is um, an injection to basically allow him to get down safely. I then continued up, still convinced I had to get to the top. Another teammate at the top of the second step had run out of oxygen. So I was with him for about 15 minutes. He was given empty canisters. I carried on going and then eventually turned around um, upon discussion of another teammate who had summited. So it was um, a catalogue of unfortunate incidents. Um, wrong place at the wrong time. And it, I basically got to a stage where it wasn't safe to carry on, uh, in my mind, to summit successfully, safely and return safely. And was that was that because of all the events that had happened in the last few hours? You had just lost too much time? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you have a turnaround time, um, which is the time when you're recommended to, if you haven't reached a certain point by a certain time, you have to turn around for your own safety. Mm -hmm. And I I wasn't at that time, but I don't think I would have summited uh, in that time frame. I, I think actually in terms of energy levels, although I was, I was tired, I probably, and I still am convinced I would have summited. I just genuinely couldn't say whether I would have got down again. Um, but part of that is an acute awareness of my own physical limitations. It was a long day. It had been a long five days. It's also the fact that I was the last one on our team. I was also 20 years old and most of the deaths happened, 70-80% of the deaths happen on Everest on the descent. The weather changes, it gets dark, it gets cold, your oxygen levels are diminished and you just don't want to become another statistic. And I came across, you know, there was a guy who died a few days after me, who, who we, we were with at base camp, very similar situation to myself. He carried on going, died on the way down. And even when I summited the following year, a very similar situation again, somebody summited too late, died on the way down from corneas freezing and from hypoxia. So, um, reduced oxygen in your body simplistically so it was um yeah it was a tough decision oddly oddly at the time though it didn't feel it didn't feel a, a very tough decision it felt like the logical decision the difficulty was probably what happened afterwards and and i definitely want to get to what happened afterwards but um what what made it an easier decision is was it the fact that there are these rigid cutoff times that are in place for a reason um did that did that help initially because you've got people climbing everest attempting to climb everest who who are hard charging uh alpha a type personalities they want to achieve things and get up and unless you have i mean i'm 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 hypothesizing here, unless you have very, very strict cutoff criteria, 
you're going to get people just pushing and pushing the entire way. I mean, you are correct, of course. I think the type of personality drawn to that mountain in particular means the idea of turning around and not succeeding is less likely than on um, mountains that people aren't familiar with, that don't have the cost, that don't have the ego attached to it. Mm. However, the, heart, the cutoff times weren't rigid. I, I passed my guide about 10 minutes before I uh, turned around, actually, and he basically gave me the all clear to continue. He assessed my state, assessed the timings I had, and actually was fine. And the, the last radio communications that were passed back to my family was that I was in a, um, a reasonable situation. I think that they said the line was looking strong for the summit or something like that. So I was actually, I had the all clear to go ahead. I just, um, I, didn't, I didn't feel it was right. Yeah. Wow. An incredible story there. So, so I imagine your your immediate concern then is is just safely getting back down to a to a to a, a safe spot. When when did it when did it hit you, if at all, that that you had not been successful? I think as soon as you make a decision like that, all, all of the uh, all of the adrenaline and focus you have obviously shuts off straight away and getting down was incredibly difficult i mean as it was the following year but you just have to you know, keep on moving but all those small um you know discomforts that you put to one side when you're trying to aim towards a goal suddenly become very very present uh, and it was very i remember my throat was in a terrible state um I had this throat problem the whole time breathing at high altitude and I was sort of coughing up blood and I hadn't eaten or drunk for a long time and I remember Max who I was with gave me a couple of throat sweets and then I sucked on those for a couple of minutes and as soon as they finished it was just excruciating um, and my back was in a terrible state I had chronic back injury after it and uh, I think all of those were very very present but either way I, we got down safely somehow and I genuinely well, on the descent, actually, my teammate, um, Matt, another guy, fell in a crevasse, which was a disaster. We had a shocking storm on the way down. So it was actually, it was a, a bit of an epic coming down, which I think I had I'd, I'd forgotten about until I started writing um, the book on my Everest book or the Seven Summits book, because I genuinely had forgotten this. I just put it in a, a box and then it sort of came out and I went back through my blogs and his blogs and we all slightly were traumatized I think by the experience but we got back down to base camp I left I remember I took a video message and I was in a bad state at base camp you know saying um what did I say it's like the Guinness advert the best things come to those who wait um but it wasn't to be this year and my face was charred here it was in a, lips were were ripped open I don't think I was very happy and, and I got back and I was I remember my family saw me at the airport and they were very happy to see me, but I think they were, I think this is when the, the age thing comes in. I don't think I had quite acknowledged that what I'd done was, was impressive. Uh, I just focused on the fact that I hadn't succeeded. And I, I remember even on the flight back, but yeah, the captain comes on the line and says, look to your right, you'll see Mount Everest as we went over the Nepal and I just couldn't. I couldn't it's the look last at it. thing you want to see on the flight home, right? If you right. haven't got to, yeah, yeah. And I just, uh, I think it took a bit of um, reframing. I remember listening, which I know you'll probably ask about the um, reframing failure thing. And I, I remember listening to a podcast with Matthew Said and read his book as well about uh, how people take failure. And the fact that some people take it as a failure in itself and certain personalities often they never see it as a failure. They just see it as part of a, a wider learning curve. And I think I probably eventually got to that stage, but it took a lot of analysis and conversations and um, self-reflection to basically be able to say, yes, that was the right thing to do. The choices I made were correct. Given the situation, I do the same thing again. And I think once you get to that stage, it's okay. But up until then, I, be, I did do it as a failure because I just hadn't succeeded in this 
very almost obsessive, polarized, or, yeah, to blink a perspective on something Everest. Yeah, Black Box Thinking, one of my all-time favorite books, actually. Um, yeah, exactly. So how how long how long did you wait before starting the preparations for your second attempt? So I mean, I I got back from in 2010 and I remember making a video my poor girlfriend um, who had diligently waited for me and lovingly waited for me I then saw but I was I needed to write about the experience and write a blog post just to clarify I think to clarify what I wanted to think rather than what I actually thought I think what I actually thought was was rather more um, displeased um, and slightly saddened but I wrote a blog post that was a saying all the right things about reframing failure and looking forward to the future. And I made a video of the expedition. And even at the end of the video, I said, you know, maybe Everest next year from the other side. And I think I was already hadn't, <laughs> hadn't quite accepted that this wasn't going to happen. And then maybe a couple of months down the line, I started to, um, to reframe it and, and put then Antarctica and then Indonesia and then end up with Everest um, as the final mountain of the seven. So probably by the end of the summer, maybe July, August, I got I went to the um, Alps, um, climbed the Matterhorn, which was I think really important, just to basically give myself a, you can do this, you know how to climb, climb an iconic mountain that you've dreamed of, and it sort of gave me the impetus to um, pursue it again. And and apart from that bit of preparation, was there anything significantly different during the second attempt? Uh, I did a, I did a lot of things different actually. I think um, probably on a slight black box thinking mindset, but I, I you know, I, I follow and watch and play a lot of sport, and there's the mindset of controlling the controllables, and I think I did a lot of that. And I all of those things that I hadn't thought about that much. I basically worked out that the, the deficit of my preparation and basically just set sort of almost a 10 point plan about what I needed to do to change. You can't control the weather, you know, you can't control what the Chinese do regarding permits on Everest, but you can control when you take salt tablets, when you take throat tablets, how much water you drink, what food you can have at high camp, what time you set off, what mm. ice axes you have, what spare head torches you have with you, how you warm up your batteries, how you warm up your cameras, you know, how much food you consume at base camp in order to prepare you for higher up the mountain. All of these small things, the whole 1% marginal gains things that in themselves, they're not game changers at all. But if you start to basically reframe it and say, what you're trying to do is perform for a five day period, of course, for the summit, but certainly for one one day summit attempt, you're basically aiming towards that. It's it's like you go through a a football tournament, but it ends up in a Champions League final, and you're you're basically trying. Or if you're an Olympian, you prepare for four years and and you try and perform on the hundred meter final day, and you've got to get your body and mind in that state. And it was the same with with Everest. It was like you can be tired, you're expected to be tired, you're expected to have ailments, but you basically need to be in a position that come 9 p.m. on the 25th of May, you leave your tent and you're in the best state you can be. You're leaving at the right time with the right equipment and everything that you can control is correct. And then you set off and you can acknowledge that there's things you can't control. But basically, you've put all the, all the eggs in the right baskets. And... I felt actually with with that attempt, it it went inverted commas smoothly. Um, I had a one terrible day the day before my summit day. I, I no two days before my summit day. I messed up because my ego slightly got in the way of me. I decided not to use oxygen. I had this thing about using oxygen at a certain height, not at a lower height, and. I didn't use it and my teammates were and I was suddenly behind them when I was in front the whole trip. And I think I struggled with the fact that I was now struggling and they were 
serenely going ahead. And it was a very long day. But other than that, it went okay, actually. Well, well done. Um, when you finally get to the top, and and, and I'm and I'm trying to I'm trying to create this image in my head of of the of the elation that you that you must feel, yet you, you've got the prospect of a descent, which, as you said, most most people who die end up dying on the way down. How how long do you do you get to spend on the top, and and, and what are you thinking about when you're there? Uh, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, and again, this is when I, I look at pictures of the last few years in queues of people. And I, I spoke to my teammates about this as well, because I can't, I can't relate to those images at all. I spent, you know, four months on that mountain was never really in a queue. And on my summit day, I was lucky enough to be at the top with just my Sherpa and I. Um, and you have this astonishing experience where you're in a very special location with great people around you. And then my teammates joined me and it was an amazing moment, but it, oddly the elation, it was a sort of a deep, deep satisfaction. It wasn't a sort of joyous celebratory, I'm on top of the world shouting. It was just a sort of serene satisfaction in where we were and the view we had. And it, I spoke to my mum, dad, and girlfriend actually from the summit. Um, my guide had a satellite phone, so I called them, and that was an extraordinary experience being able to do that. I was grateful. I remembered their phone numbers um, at that height, but that was something you don't forget. And more than that, I remember I didn't take my first photo from the summit for about 45 minutes. And I think in itself, that sort of represents the fact that I was basically just sat down, not budging, just like this is an extraordinary place to be. And just, I had my oxygen mask off and I think was just trying to take it in. Um, and then I ended up spending about 75 minutes at the summit, I think, which is a, a pretty long time, surrounded by just, yeah, our Sherpas and my teammates. So um, very fortunate. And then, um, I remember dad, dad on the phone sort of giving advice about safely coming down and, you know, be careful. Yeah. And I think that was at the forefront of my mind. But basically you then just turn around and head downhill. Um, and it was, again, tricky. You're just very tired. And all of those, as I said before, those ailments start to come to the surface. But um, it's sort of, you know, you, you have a reason to keep going. Incredible. I'd like to pivot away from that um, fantastic experience and 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 the the adventure that you had had over the over those three, four, five years. Um, you joined the army shortly after. Um, a year at Sandhurst is is how officers start their career in the British Army, and that that year for for most people is an incredible test mentally and physically um you you mentioned so many things just a minute ago controlling the controllables having everything dialed in that you can that you can possibly have an effect on in order to make sure you can get from from a to b so many parallels with what what you would have to do at sandhurst and in your career in the army um how how did, how did those experiences prepare you for uh, that that first year at sandhurst in particular I think those seven summits certainly they come they came at an age what seventeen to twenty two. Um, it's a pretty informative age. I think about forming identity certainly. University is part of that as well. But I think those climbs were an amazing experience of people you meet, perspectives you gain insights from far more experienced people than myself in those situations and from all over the world. I mean, from every nationality and background and culture. And I feel that experience is, is very enlightening. I think you also, you see the slightly the best and worst of, of people's characters as well. 
because certainly on something like Everest, the egos are, are so much, but you see immense selflessness, resourcefulness, kindness, uh, just as much as you see ego and and just internal drive and narcissism. It's it's a sort of very odd mountain in that regard. Um, but I think all, all of those experiences then take you to a place like Sandhurst, which historically people probably did at 19. Now they probably do it on average at about 23. But it's uh, a very different environment and certainly coming straight from university and generally having a slight disregard for rules since I was a kid. I think it was um, quite a tricky transition. I think there's a bit of me that that felt that I should do Sandhurst, not should in a peer pressure sort of way, but uh, this is going to be good for you. It's just like, it's not like cowpole. Cowpole's good medicine, it tastes nice. This is the sort of medicine that might not be the most pleasant tasting, but it's fundamentally good for you in the long term. Sandhurst, thankfully, also had cowpole elements of fun. I thought it was an immensely funny year. I mean, it really was hilarious, but I did find it very constraining and very um, frustrating in the parameters it sets on you. But I also was conscious then and I'm aware now that it needs to be like that. And it will probably always be like that. And there will always be people like me trying to toe the line and butt their head over it and, and get frustrated by the system. But that's probably the nature of it. Yeah. Speaking from experience also, it, um, it, it, I think type, type two fun is, is, a, is a phrase that some people use when they talk about their time at a place like Sandhurst. Uh, and you look back and you think, Wow, that that was a really unique experience. How incredible! Um, I I think for most people, when they're there, they're uh, just kind of gritting their teeth and trying to get through it. Um, fantastic. I, I I'd like to to, to switch gears slightly, um, if you'll excuse the pun, and talk about your your bike ride, if if I can even call it a bike ride, because it's it's a, a bike ride of epic proportions. Um, in your book. A Rolling Stone, you uh, you write about the struggle to get across Kazakhstan, and I've got a, I'll, I'll just read a, a quote here. You say, "Time seemed to stand still, trapping me in an unhappy world of darkness and self-reflection." I thought about Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. In it, he writes, "If there is truly nothing you can do to change your here and now." and you can't remove yourself from the situation, then accept you're here and now totally by dropping all inner resistance. Heavily inspired, I think, by Stoic philosophy, and it immediately reminded me of a speech by a chap called James Stockdale, who was <clears throat> an American fighter pilot in the Vietnam War. He spent seven and a half years in a, in a Vietnamese prisoner of war camp and the inspiration he, he, he talks about the inspiration he drew from Epictetus and other Stoic philosophers um, and, and how that gave him strength to persevere and push through. I know that, that, that you take inspiration from Finnish culture um, and you write about that in your in your first book. Can you talk about that um, that inspiration? And, and in particular, what your inner voice is saying to you when you're in these incredibly testing situations. Yeah, okay, interesting. I think the inner voice aspect, go on to that in a sec. So the first one is the Finnish culture. I spent a lot of time in Scandinavia anyway, um, pre-army, post-army, I think there's a lot of parts of Scandinavia which I miss and enjoy, but also that we could probably learn from as well. But they have a lot of it's untranslatable words. Um, you know, Nor Norway is 
uh, things like freeless live, which is which is this desire to be outside and exploring outside. And I remember when I set off from Astana, actually in Kazakhstan, I referenced a Swedish word called rusfeber, which is the fear of of setting off that uncertain sense of foreboding. But the the first book was called In Search of Sisu, and Sisu is uh, comes from the Finnish word historically meaning sisus which is the sort of the bowels, the intestines of, a, of an animal, I think it was a sheep. And it basically, they, Finnish culture is, they're still finding their identity slightly as a country, not now, but they, they were, and Sisu is intrinsically linked to Finnish culture. They certainly had a, an epic um, World War II campaign against Russia in the north, and they used this Sisu culture, and it it's sort of a mixture of of courage, resilience, determination, grit, resolve, stoicism. It's sort of all of those things. And that's one aspect of it, which is the sheer resilience side of it, of in simple terms on a mountain, for example, it's putting one step in front of another. On, you know, in Sandhurst terms, it's pushing on during a long tab in the Black Mountains or something like that. Is that shit? I don't want to continue, but I'm going to have to keep going. And then there's the other side of it, which I found interesting, which is the cease of just going outside of your comfort zone. It's in a simple way, it's sort of taking a, I think an expert said it's like taking a, taking a leap into the unknown without any wings, but believing that you'll find them on the way down which might sound foolhardy, but I don't see it as that way. I think it's it's sort of about the ability to take risks, to leap into a new relationship, to start a new business, to move jobs, to, to leave the army and go on a big cycle trip. I think they're all part of the same narrative. And even with that first book, I wrote about some of the issues I had when I was a teenager. And... I mean, mental health issues, but also other ones along the way. And I, I feel that's all part of the same narrative. It's the ability to to just slightly step outside of comfort zone and almost confront demons rather than let them dominate a narrative. And I, I sort of, in terms of the Kazakhstan bit, Sisi was part of that, I think, setting off knowing that it's going to be viciously cold as it was which was minus 30 minus 40 every day was a horrendous thought i was genuinely worried before setting off and anxious uh, because i knew how uncomfortable it would be and this is when the danger of personal experience comes into it because if you don't have the experience you're naive you're blinkered you're still in plato's cave because you haven't seen the light yet and there's a danger like in Plato's cave of of that analogy of coming outside and seeing the light because it's then makes it quite terrifying and because I, I'd been in very very uncomfortable situations I knew what it would be like to have that winter by myself why you then do it begs a different question but I sort of knew therefore that it would be unpleasant it would be self-suffering but that fundamentally you can get through it and I think that's part of the CC mentality of knowing that you can get through it. And you ask about inner voice, and it's a not dissimilar narrative, which is if you're in a tent by yourself and you're doing sit-ups at three in the morning to try and get your heart rate up because you're shivering and having a cigarette out the porch of your tent because it's the only thing that gets you through another 10 minutes, which is the reality. And having to change your top in the morning because it's frozen over. And I mean, it was very, very unpleasant. Um, you know, I've had blocks of ice that I put in a cup of tea just to try and eke out the water a bit more. And I had four flasks around me and my bread was freezing in my sleeping bag. It was very, very tricky. But you basically then have this situation of, I just need to get to the next checkpoint. And you're always looking forwards and it was, it's interesting, I was reading that book, Eckhart Tolle's Power of Now, at the time. Um, and I, you know, even that, I had gloves and mitts and I had these few pages that I'd get through. And I sort of, 
I felt that by reading that, you're trying to find something and you're trying to accept your position. But I would also look forward to I'd be like, okay, it's three in the morning now. All I need to do is get to morning. Sun rises and then it's okay. So you get to, it was midwinter, so say nine, 10 o'clock in the morning. Then the sun comes up and you go, okay, cool. I'm alive. I'm well. I can then get through to this day. I can't stay in my tent because if I stay in my tent, I'll die. So you then have to get up and you eventually motivate your mind to wriggle out of your sleeping bag. It's like getting up on a stag. It's awful. Um, wriggle out of your sleeping bag and start the day and prepare your bike. You move as far as you can during the day. Sunset's coming. You set up ten, and then you get through to the next morning. And it's even when riding, you split the bike up and you have an hour riding, which is hard and it's tiring, but it's basically okay because you're moving. And then you stop, but you look forward to the stops. You look forward to that ten minute break where you're not riding, and then you take a break, and then you look forward to the the next thing. And it always looking ahead slightly. Thought that was important. It's that the the progress principle, right? If you can demonstrate to yourself that you are making progress by having these yeah. milestones and breaking things down, it's gonna help gonna help motivate you, I guess, even through situations that you're in, which 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 are you know, dire. I I certainly fell into the trap before I read your book. I fell into the trap of thinking that wow, what a what an incredible thing to do! I w I would love to be in the situation where I could just drop everything and go, and have and have that adventure. Um, you know, it's just this just this romantic idea that I think a lot of people have in their heads, but never actually do anything about it. You did. Um, you you write in the book a and this is on that topic, you write in the book about getting a text message from a friend, New Year's Eve, 2018 to 19, saying words to that effect, right? Oh, you know, missing you, hope, hope you're well. Um, all of us back home really wish we, we could be out there with you or doing something like this. You're so lucky. Um, meanwhile, you're in a irrigation ditch underneath a Chinese motorway. <laughs> um, and, and, and you write about how that affected you. Can you talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, again, talking, about, talking about PTSD and traumatized by some of these experiences, I, th I think I do genuinely compartmentalize them. Um, I think it was that whole period, winter, I got through Kazakhstan, incredibly cold, and talking about um, progress curves, I was obsessed by going south um, and I was like if I go south I'll be warmer if I go into China I'll be warmer if I go through this route I'll be warmer like everything was about getting warmer and looking forward to wearing sandals and t-shirts and <laughs> not being the position I was and uh, which makes it also sound like it wasn't fun I had some amazing experiences along the way it wasn't just masochistic um, endeavors but that stint in Northwest China was, I think, genuinely unpleasant. I can't think of many periods of my life that were worse than that off the top of my head for, in terms of consistent strain. I was in, um, in Xinjiang in Northwest China, highly contentious part of the world where there's about um, a million and a half Uyghurs being imprisoned and um, the police uh, presence in the area was ubiquitous and very frustrating for me. I mean, what's happening to them is the side product we, or a side track we probably shouldn't go down. Um, but I found my experiences very um, draining. I, the police would uh, stop me, you know, five, ten times a day. And I was held up in police custody for a very long time at the start and every single day be interrogated by them, them going through my kit, uh, them stopping me camping anywhere I didn't want to go, forcing me to stay in hotels, tracking my phone, you know, moving me in their vehicles from one to another, having photos of my passports all over the place and very unpleasant. Um, they couldn't They couldn't just get that you were just a guy trying to ride a bike across the country? 
they, uh, they, they didn't believe I, that. They, they they didn't get it. I mean, they might have, they might not. I think the fact that it was minus thirty, and I rocked up on a bike, I think they thought was extraordinary. And I don't think they, I think they struggled to get their head around why I was there. And they always asked me in these interviews, you know, what do you know about either marked or unmarked police? Men and women would sort of ask what I knew about Xinjiang, what I knew about the Uyghurs. I studied history at the university. They wanted to know about whether I cared about the history. And I also studied theology at university. They wanted to know whether I cared about the religious beliefs of the people there. I think they were just uh, slightly wary of my intentions. Uh, did they, know that, did, well, did they so, know that you were a veteran as well? I put it down on my initial application form. I sort of had the view, certainly with that, that it was better to be honest than get found out um, that I was being dishonest. I thought I, I fundamentally didn't want to get thrown out of the country as well. Um, from a selfish point of view, it would have messed up my trip, but I didn't want to. And in many ways, they were arguably right in their wariness because I ended up writing about the experience and um, have happily talked about it since. And I was advised not to, but I, I genuinely believed and still believe it was important to share it. So um, maybe they were right, but basically they just made it very tricky as a as a traveler because you're basically not acting in the same way that most tourists are. I met a few tourists in Urumqi, which is the capital of the province, and, you know, Dutch, Swedish, Japanese travelers, and they were fine. They could go on a bus and go somewhere, and it was very restricted where they could go, and they would do that, and then they would return, and that's fine. You can keep track of people like that. When you're on a bike, you can't. You're a slight anomaly to their system. And I think they were very intrigued by that, which is not not always the situation you want. Um, so I found the whole experience very, very draining, actually, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I think I was, I was actually unhappy uh, in that time and just sort of looking forward um, just to not be where I was in a in a negative way rather than trying to embrace the the, the there and now as well um but going back to that um text that joe sent he's a great friend and he was with me at sandhurst and he was basically looking out for my welfare but he also isn't on social media so he didn't see the slightly tongue-in-cheek comments i'd make about the police being um, around every day and instead he just sort of texted me on New Year's as a kind friend to just say happy New Year's mate thinking of you and and I was so stuck in my own mind I had to rethink about this because I didn't have reception so I was just by myself under a bridge and it goes back to your point about perception versus reality and and these trips are extraordinary experiences and experiences that having gone through the process i then look back and i'm incredibly grateful to have gone through but it doesn't mean they're all um beautiful sunsets and rose tinted glasses and uh you know cycling off into the wilderness by yourself and everything's happy as larry they're also very tricky and they require a lot of self-sacrifice and acceptance of uncertainty maybe that's why you go on them i very consciously made the choice to go through siberia in winter i made the choice to go through xinjiang and i didn't need to so i think there's something in my mind that wanted to take it to an extreme either socially or politically or environmentally wanted to go to to my absolute limit and see what you can cope with. And I think a lot of that trip was about that. It was seeing, okay, I'm doing this cycle tour. I want to do it in the most authentic way I thought possible. And that was about not suffering, but just finding a limit. Well, you certainly push that limit. 
I think, and probably broke through it a few times. Uh, an incredible story. We we oh, well, I I could certainly talk and ask you a dozen more questions, but but we're getting up to the fifty minute point for this chat. So I've I've got one final question for you. Um, the work that we do at, at PA Consulting is is all about unlocking ingenuity within our clients' organizations. Across your career and the many adventures that you've had, where have you seen ingenuity demonstrated to, to really great effect? Interesting. Uh, I've always been interested in innovative ideas, ingenuity, exciting thinkers. A good friend of mine constantly mocks me because I cared about Elon Musk a lot years ago because I thought he was genuinely pioneering. And he thought I was getting on board with a cult, which because Tesla is now massive. At the time, I just thought it was exciting that you could have someone who's trying to do something different. And I work for Amazon now. And it's a similar thing with what Bezos has done at Amazon. It's just about constantly innovating. Um, and I think that's exciting. Amazon has this um, day one culture. Just, I mean, Amazon is a very, a very clear identity. It's got very clear 14 leadership principles, clear peculiar working practice. But it also, because of that identity, part of it is accepting uncertainty. It's about being curious. It's about learning constantly. And it's about never resting on your laurels. And the day one culture is part of that. It's the fact that every day is day one, that you're always needing to learn and innovate and stay ahead of not the competition. You're you're innovating because you have to innovate because otherwise you get stuck behind. And even I was discussing this with my dad about being of a different generation, but trying to keep up with modern technology, about not being a Luddite by remaining at the forefront of of technology and work often does that and i think at amazon it's great even i work in amazon operations so basically this is a structured part of the company that's been going on for years this is basically you buying your um standard package on amazon prime unit and it coming the next day but the process is always tweaking um you know i work in operations in the yard and it's always changing just when you get to the stage where you think you're settled and you have everything under control. You get new projects coming at you, you get new ideas, new process changes. And I think that sort of culture of innovation and change is very important because it just keeps you going and it keeps it keeps you interested as a worker. But there's so many other challenges that come with it. It's about it's about what we first mentioned, which is that culture of willingness to fail and encouraging failure, but not encouraging failure for the sake of it, encouraging failure because you're slightly pushing, you're pushing to the limit, you're finding the stress test limits, and then you can fail, and then you can re then you can innovate again, reassess, and come up with a new idea and solving this, solving a problem. And I think that's a really good culture. Thank you. It, it certainly takes a unique mindset to be comfortable in that type of environment, um, but it is essential. We we talk a lot about psychological safety um, at PA Consulting, and and it's and it's on leaders at all levels to encourage that um, that voicing up of ideas, that constant search for for something new, something better, challenging, um, because without it it is it is very difficult for people to to break through that and and, and be in it in innovative although you know, deep down everyone wants to be everyone wants to be um trying something new and doing something you know that's potentially going to be successful but there is that fear um thank you what a great answer Sorry. is that the back to work buzzer ah. geordie no that's right <laughs> it's now stopped thankfully <laughs> Hey, look, well, that's that's a good note to end it on, I think. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for taking the time and being so so open and, and honest about your experiences. I think there's a lot that people can learn from 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 you and, and the, the challenges that you've you've overcome. So thank you again. 
and uh, look forward to hearing what uh, what happens next.